Yeah. Good morning, everybody. And first of all, great thanks to the organizers for letting me uh, present our stuff. Um, I don't need to explain you guys how many diseases are have an oxidative stress component in their etiology. I'd say it's probably just about every disease we can think about. So what's in red here is orphan diseases and the rest in black is main diseases. It's just a short, short list of uh, all possible um, diseases with oxidative stress. Just to give you one example, in uh, Down syndrome you have, uh, oops, sorry, you have three chromosomes 21 rather than two. And what that results in, you have uh, superoxide dismutase one, uh, you will have it at 50% higher level than normal, but the catalase, which is encoded on a different chromosome, will stay on a normal level, so you will have an excess of hydrogen peroxide, which actually unleashes the elevated oxidative stress. Intriguingly also, uh, with regards um, Down syndrome, APP is also sitting on the same chromosome. As you know, uh, they all die of uh, early onset Alzheimer's. Um, so there are two major types of oxidative stress. Um, if you imagine a reactive oxygen species, whichever way it is born, coming and hitting on an amino acid or on a protein or on a DNA base, that would ultimately result in a one unit of damage. So it's stoichiometric. One reactive oxygen species generates one unit of damage. So however bad the damage is, you will just have one, one unit of damage. There is an exception to that. There is a type of biomolecule called lipid, polyunsaturated lipid, which undergoes multiple damage uh, when hit with one reactive oxygen species. This is all because the damage happens through the chain reaction format. So you only need one initiating event to damage great many different lipids. Um, so let me just illustrate how bad it is and what we decided to do about it. So a little bit of chemistry. This is a typical polyunsaturated fatty acid, the simplest one with just two double bonds uh, called linoleic acid. And the weakest bond here in the molecule is this CH bond between the two double bonds. So you have a reactive oxygen species coming and what's known in, the, in the chemistry, abstracting this hydrogen of this carbon, leaving a radical behind. This radical can rearrange somewhat. And then, because there is always plenty of oxygen in the membranes, in fact, lipids enrich uh, oxygen compared to aqueous levels of oxygen. You have about six-fold level in uh, lipids. So there is always plenty of molecular oxygen. It very quickly reacts uh, with this radical. Um, forming a very nasty species called lipid peroxyle, and it's still a radical in itself. Now, this species is perfectly capable of doing the same thing to the next intact molecule of a lipid, which you have plenty of in the membranes, essentially sustaining the cycle of lipid peroxidation. That's, that's, that's how the chain reaction works. So once it abstracts a hydrogen from a new intact molecule, it then becomes a lipid peroxide, which is now incapable of abstracting, but it can decompose if you have uh, transition metals or things like that. It can decompose and further amplify the cycle. And what is bad about it? You change the properties of the membranes, because you need these polyunsaturated fatty acids to render membranes fluid, because there is lots of docking of proteins going on, and uh, they are full of life, the membranes. And in the same way in which diary butter is solid and uh, uh, what's in the bottle of olive oil is liquid, the only difference is one double bond on the oleic acid in olive oil. In the same way, you need a lot of double bonds in membranes to make sure that they can perform properly. But the other side of that is they are very vulnerable to oxidation. And the organisms, mammals at least, they cannot produce these things, so we are entirely relying on the outside supply. These things are called essential nutrients. So <clears throat> this blue, huge blue chunk 
like a C is lipids. This is a fragment of a mitochondrial membrane. This, is, this slide is here just to illustrate the point that there is no way you could possibly stop this damage using antioxidants. Simply because of the numbers, the number of polyunsaturated fatty acids in the membrane outnumbers any possible level of antioxidants you could ever possibly hope to attain by eating bucketfuls of uh, fruits and vegetables or whatever. And because react foxin species pop up stochastically in the membrane, in other words, they can appear anywhere as a result of the normal functioning of um, Oxford's pathway. In fact, some estimates, they vary. Uh, some people say it's up to 1% of the total oxygen. Some people say it's probably uh, one-tenth of that. But anyhow, it's a huge, huge number. The number of oxygen molecules that rather than participating in the ox force, they would go astray and form the react, react oxygen species, which can then initiate the chain reaction damaging these lipids. Um, so the only way conceivably to stop it with antioxidants would be to park an antioxidant right next to each lipid in the membrane. But then the problem you see is you could theoretically do it in models if you put an, an antioxidant right next to this lipid and to this one and to this one, you can stop the chain, but then it will stop being a membrane. The membrane is when the lipids are like this. So there is only a very limited room for antioxidants. In fact, the normal ratio of, let's say, tocopherols to um, uh, lipid to puffer residues in the membrane is about one to 2,000. In some certain cases, like in the eye, in the stacks that hold rhodopsin, where the oxidation is really rampant, you may have it 100 puffer molecules to polyunsaturated fatty acid molecules to one tocopherol. But normally, it's, so it's two to three orders of magnitude. So there is no way you could possibly stop the chain. Um, just some numbers for you to take home. Uh, everybody knows that the brain is about um, one to two percent of the body weight. And everybody knows that it nevertheless requires 20% of the total energy that we produce for its functioning. What is less known is that five, um, a, the whole quarter of those 20%, i.e. 5% of the total energy we produce, is actually expended by fix, to fix damaged lipids in the brain. So from this you see that lipid peroxidation is probably the most important negative factor that we have in our body because of the chain reaction format. And surely brain recognizes it, otherwise it wouldn't be spending that much energy. Um, but nobody is actually seriously investigating li lipid peroxidase. I mean, people are more concerned about DNA and master switches and whatnot, or maybe proteins and antibodies. Lipids are definitely an outcast, but I think this is, this is a major oversight. And antioxidants cannot help. So here is what we tried to do. You, we just went through the mechanics of um, the lipid peroxidation process. So the rate limiting step, the step that defines the rate of the whole process, is actually this hydrogen abstraction step. So we decided to put deuteriums instead of hydrogens at these positions to slow the rate limiting step down. And if you want to slow the chemical reaction down, you have to go after the rate limiting step. That's just the mantra. And we started off with two simplest representatives of polyunsaturated fatty acids, uh, the, f the simplest omega-6. And again, they are essential. We have to consume these things with food. We cannot make them. We will die without them in the diet. This is an omega-6. Uh, the reason it's called omega-6 is you count the carbons from the hydrophobic end before you hit the first double bond. So there are six here and three here. So this is the simplest omega-3 called linolenic acid. And this is the simplest omega-6 called linoleic acid. So if you give these two to animals, they can live and they will survive. If you don't, they will die. So we put deuteriums chemically at these positions, hoping to slow down the chain reaction. Let me show you how it worked. This is our workhorse. Yeast is our workhorse, actually. Uh, so this mutant here um, does not make coenzyme Q. Now, coenzyme Q is not just an electron shuttle. It also is a major antioxidant. And this yeast can actually live without that um, major antioxidant uh, if they're not stressed. 
But once you stress them with some kind of, with temperature, uh, with things like that, they do not survive because the major piece of defense is missing. Um, and in the same way, if we get, so this here is a plate, plate dilution assay. I'm sure you, you guys are familiar with that. I will not spend too much time on it. And going from left to right are just dilution series. So to, to spot where the effect kicks in, where the, there is twice as much yeast in this colony here than in this one, etc. So if you give the, the wild type as a control, the, uh, this is the mutant, co coenzyme Q mutant. So if you don't give them any fatty acids in the medium, they survive just fine. If you give them linoleic acid, the essential omega-6, the simplest essential omega-6, it does them in. You see, there is no colonies because there is no antioxidant defenses, so the material comes in, it is needed, they are avidly seeking it out and getting it from the medium and incorporating it, that saves them a lot of energy, but they don't know that they are missing the major antioxidant uh, weapon, and therefore it starts, getting, it starts the chain reaction and that wipes them off. So when we make the molecule with two deuteriums, at the key position where the abstraction happens. You see, we could restore the yeast. They are no longer dying when fed on this type of linoleic acid. So some early criticism we faced was, well, perhaps deuterium just has some, um, you know, macro physical chemical properties which makes it somewhat different from hydrogen, like somewhat like fluorinated compounds perhaps. So in response to those criticisms, we shifted deuterium from the key position where the abstraction happens to the position next door, but not important with regards to the abstraction. And you see that this compound, which still has two deuteriums, but not in, in the wrong place, it is as toxic to yeast as a non-deuterated one. So that was as expected, and we also demonstrated using all sorts of techniques like BDP dyes, which report on lipid peroxidation events. We used the seahorse machine which interrogates the mitochondrial performance, we did show and demonstrate that we are actually shutting down the non-enzymatic lipid peroxidation process. We did uncover more than we bargained for, I have to say. That we managed to uncover a really, really interesting feature of these deuterated PUFAs, which we did not anticipate initially when we set off to, to to look at that, which is really useful. I mean, uh, with a hindsight, I don't know what we could possibly do if we could shut down lipid peroxidation using deuterated lipids, but if we did not find the thing which we now call the 20% effect. Because to make it work in humans, which is ultimately the goal, we would need to substitute every single molecule of a lipid that we all have in every membrane with our deuterated stuff. Very impractical, because everybody deep in heart, still wants to go to McDonald's and stuff themselves with uh, uh, Big Macs, but uh, it will be then difficult to compete with that. You will have to completely restructure your diet. But it turns out we don't need to, because look, again, back, back to the same yeast model. 100% non-deuterate linoleic acid kills the yeast. 100% deuterate linoleic acid restores the viability. However, once we start mixing, non-deuterated and deuterated. You see at a low, a very low level of deuterate, only 5% of total, we see the yeast coming back to life, such that at 15%, only at 15% of deuterate material in, on the background of totally non-deuterated, the protection is as strong as it is for 100% effect. And the same we observed for linolenic acid, which is the omega-3. And it works in a crisscross fashion conveniently also, because for, for polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are really important, like EPA, DHA, and arachidonic, you see we can spike EPA with 20% D2 linoleic, and we completely, we, we completely restore the viability of yeast. Very handy. So uh, that was the yeast experiment. To zoom in on more, but because you can always say that this is uh, lipid peroxidation is a chemical event. However, what is the distance between the cell death, God knows how that happens in yeast, and the initial lipid peroxidation? There, there could be zillions of steps. So to zoom in on the actual chemical uh, processes which are behind this effect, we made liposomes. Everybody knows what that is. And uh, we made them using deuterated 
using phospholipids, lipids, that is the material, that is the form of lipid you, you need to, to form liposomes. And we had phospholipids containing as a, well, there, there is always a fully saturated chain. There is a phosphoric acid, phosphoric acid containing head, but there is always a molecule of a polyunsaturated uh, fatty acid as well. So we had it with deuterated linoleic acid, deuterated linolenic acid, deuterated arachidonic acid, deuterated EPA, and deuterated DHA. These five are all possible polyunsaturated fatty acids we rely on. And we made liposomes, and we used liposomes made of linoleic acid as a background, spiked with small quantities of deuterated um, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And an interesting, uh, interesting uh, ratio we've uncovered here is that if let's, let's, so, so we were measuring, you, there are several ways you can measure lipid peroxidation liposomes. We used several proxies, leaking fluorophores, or for example, absorbance at 234, which reports on the formation of conjugate double bonds, which is the first product of uh, lipid peroxidation. You can see the red curve here, that is deuterated linoleic acid in non-deuterated linoleic acid. So you can see that if we call arbitrarily, if we call this, this level between these two points, this level here, is stopping lipid peroxidation. You can see that that happens at about 20% red curve of deuterated linoleic acid in the liposome, which is something we have previously established in, uh, in yeast. Now, but you, it takes much less of uh, D4 linolenic acid to the level of 15%. The blue curve here is arachidonic. It takes even less arachidonic or even less of EPA. And amazingly, it takes about 1% of deuterated DHA in totally non-deuterated um, background of um, bilayers to completely shut down the, the chain reaction. Very useful, particularly if we're talking about the brain or the eye, which are chock full of, uh, of DHA, which means in practical terms, we don't need to substitute everything. We just need to push in about 1% of our materials, and we will have an effect. And another great advantage of that is we don't need to interfere with any enzymatic processing of lipids because it's such a complex thing. You have cyclooxygenases, lipoxygenases, cytochromes, you have beta oxidase. We don't want to touch any of that. We just want to shut down the non-enzymatically controlled chain reaction, which is the worst thing in the body. And we can do it with 1% of our material, and there will be plenty left, 99% of the remaining PUFAs fully available for the enzymatic processing. So we tried it in lots of different disease models. I will only talk about animal models. We had literally many tens of cell culture models. But let me just tell you about the, so the blue ones I'm showing here in this presentation. But there are many more done in animals, which, which it's just the time is too short. So, uh, but before I do, that point I uh, brought up about us not wanting to interfere with um, uh, with enzymatic processing of PUFAs, uh, i.e. us only wanting to shut down the non-enzymatic chain reaction, we first of all made sure that it is indeed the case using the simple mouse model. These mice were fed either on deuterated linoleic and linolenic acid in the diet as the only PUFAs in the diet, or on the equivalent controls which were linoleic and linolenic without deuteriums. And because the mice were already grown up when we started, Naturally, they were already made up of all sorts of lipids, non-deuterated. And we started substituting it, pushing it out at some point in their life. So we fed them for 90 days. The only two things they, those mice were receiving were, were linoleic acid here and linolenic acid here. They're completely gone. They're really small because they were all converted into higher PUFAs, arachidonic, EPA, DHA. But what's most important here, so what I'm showing here is the cohort fed on deuterated lipids. What's most important is, this peak here is, for, for example, for arachidonic acid. You see that at, at 90 days, we had, what, about 30, 35% of all arachidonic acid in those mice being deuterated because it was obtained by extension of deuterated linoleic acid. And the same for DHA, et cetera, et cetera. And in the control group, which did not get any deuterated materials, it only had non-deuterated, you can see 
that naturally there was no blue stuff there because there was no deuterium. But the most important thing here in this picture is that the profile, the fingerprint of lipids, is exactly overlappable. So it's exactly the, the like for like. There is the same quantity, relatively speaking, of arachidonic here in both cohorts, the same quantity of EPA, of DHA, which means we did not disturb any enzymatics of, in case of the deuterate materials, because the, the fingerprint profile is the same. So encouraged with that, we first of all tried the MPTP model, uh, which I'll probably not spend too much time talking about. It's arguably relevant or not relevant to human Parkinsonism, and it's, it's an old work. Just the bottom line, we could manage to uh, prop up uh, dopamine levels in MPTP-treated mice on DPUFA diet compared to the uh, MPTP-treated mice on uh, HPUFA diet. You see this difference here is thanks to the presence of deuterium. The uh, tyrosyl hydroxylase was also up, and other. this is published, so you can, you can uh, look it up if you want. So um, the, in the most re recent piece, we tried this um, modern model of Parkinsonism, whereby you take a human alpha synuclein gene, wrap it up in a viral vector, and carefully inject just one of the two hemispheres in the rat. And that, of course, leads to the uh, uh, so one half of that rat, the opposite half of that rat, will become kind of paralyzed because alpha synuclein causes Parkinsonism. And then we could also, uh, as you can see, uh, for example, from this graph, we could, in a positive way, change the uh, onset of the disease by keeping those animals on the deuterated diet. So we tried it in the Akita mouse model, which uh, models uh, diabetic retinopathy. What happens in, in that model is that the retinal ganglion cells are dying out. And you can see, again, by keeping a mice either on uh, D or on H diet. And if, so the higher is the bar, the more retinal ganglion cells are dead. So the lower is the bar, the better. So you can see the robust difference between H PUFA and D PUFA diet in counting uh, retinal ganglion cells. We tried it in several Alzheimer's models, believe it or not. We tried it in the double transgenic model. And again, you see the difference between different A betas. You see the difference in cortex and in uh, other organs of isoprosteins, neuroprost. Now, isoprosteins come from omega-6s. Neuroprosteins come from omega-3s, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So all these, and this is also published. This is in collaboration with Mark Matson, So you can look it up if you want. Um, this is my favorite model, so I'll spend a few more words on this. Um, uh, about 40% of the East Asian population are unfortunate enough not to be able to enjoy a drink, but because their aldehyde dehydrogenase is deficient. It's actually not completely knocked off. They still retain about, I don't know, 6 7% of the activity, but nevertheless. But it's much more sinister and pernicious than that because there is no ethanol in nature, so this is a very artificial situation. Uh, but that enzyme really evolved to mop up lipid peroxidation products, because when lipids get peroxidized, they generate the whole smorgasbord of most horrible nasties, which are really toxic, and they go everywhere in the cell doing all sorts of molecular covalent damage. So that's what really is the problem with, so th those guys have Alzheimer's elevated uh, late onset, Par Parkinson's, esophageal cancer, and there are 650 million people uh, who are the carriers. So, there is, so this mouse is not exactly like that because we had a complete knockout. It's not like 7% of the activity is retained. And yet you can see this is in the water maze uh, task. We could really, uh, at the bottom of this graph, you can see that our mice, the, the knockout mice, on the D diet perform as well as the wild type. So we're not mitigating or alleviating the disease. We are resetting it back to normal, all right? And some other uh, positive uh, endpoints from the same study, which is also published, such as novel object, object recognition, the uh, maze task, et cetera, et cetera. Now, with this, we approached the FDA. FDA looked at us in a kind of a favorable way. So we decided to try it in humans in Friedrich's ataxia. Now, Friedrich's ataxia is a neurological disease, an orphan disease, 
it's, it's a Roman Empire disease, so the founder mutation was somewhere between northern Italy and uh, Romania that, is, that can now be established uh, pretty precisely. And uh, the deficiency is in a protein called frataxin, which nobody really knows that's the problem with all those diseases, what exactly is happening, but somehow it participates in packing the uh, iron sulfur clusters, which of course are tremendously important, particularly in the group of enzymes which you have in mitochondria. Um, so when that does not happen properly, you have the disturbance of iron, which is a transition metal, so it generates phantom chemistry, and all hell breaks loose. So we did try it, that is, I'll be honest with you, it did not work in the mouse model of uh, Friedrich's ataxia. We think it's just too strong an onset, too acute a model, they die really fast, we could not um, change it in any way. However, we did a bunch of cell cultures, and it looked favorable on cell cultures, and on the strength of that, plus all the other data we had at the time, the FDA actually allowed us to go into humans, and we did go into humans, and uh, the, so I'm not using the word placebo here, uh, I'm using the word comparator because in all experiments, we are deliberately not using a sugar pill, but we are using linoleic acid. In this case, it was deuterate linoleic acid called RT001. We're using that, and in comparison, we are always using the linoleic acid non-deuterated. And you can see that as far as the peak load, it definitely went up compared to the comparators which did not get the deuterate material. The peak VO2, which is the same setting, but you are just use, measuring a different thing, also went up, and the neuroscore went down, which is how it should be. The lower the neuroscores, the more normal the patients. We also had some uh, good, um, uh, good results in uh, the most horrible disease called INAD, infantile neuroaxonal dystrophy, which intriguingly, if you, it's the same gene, it's, um, uh, it's um, phospholipase. So if for whatever reason the onset happens early in life, you have INAD, but if for whatever completely unknown reason the onset happens uh, later in life, you have Parkinsonism. So you can see that there is definitely a common denominator between all sorts of neurological disease. So we had positive outcomes there. This is another horrible thing called GM1. You can see the difference six months later in the appearance of the child, and that's not the only positive difference in that case. And we extend lifespan in uh, C. elegans and in mice, Although I have to say that mice are probably the worst model uh, to study um, PUFAS and lipid peroxidation because they handle and deal with PUFAS completely differently to the way we do. For example, we will never put DHA into mitochondria, but mice do. Maybe that's the single most important reason why they live three years and we live 100. And like I said, we have now we have cracked the synthesis so we can make all these materials. And thank you very much. And at this point, I'd just like to say that we don't have any money. The capitalists hate us. So all we do, I in particular, I travel the world persuading people this is a cool stuff. So at the moment, we have more than 80 active collaborations. So it's all, unfortunately, not done by my hands or with my hands. It's all done by great people around the world. And they're too numerous to be listed here. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. So we have time for a couple questions. Uh, hello. Thank you for your talk very much. Could you uh, show us uh, lifespan data again, please? I, I actually had a uh, lifespan on worms and, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, worms, yeah, is there here? It is really modest uh, lifespan extension, it is, don't yeah. you think so? Yeah. But uh, could you explain why it, uh, it is so modest? Because a lot of drugs uh, has a great lifespan extension on C. elegans, but not yours, why? Right, well, first of all, to do it justice, it has to be done properly. I mean, if I could rerun the mouse study, yeah. where indeed the, the increase in lifespan was more, even more modest than the increase in... Um, health span, so to speak. There are lots of things that change now. Yeah. But we never had it. We are always at a mercy of people who do it, and we don't get a second chance. We don't get any chance at optimizing it. We are focusing on drugs. 
So uh, if there is ever any chance to run it properly, I'll, I'll jump on it. But uh, that's, it is what it is at the moment. OK, I may do it properly for you, if yeah, you want. But do you have funding? Uh, I have the elegance. <laughs> OK, we need okay. to discuss. OK, let's discuss, yeah. I'll be happy. Okay, one last question. Um, when you sh so you showed that when you feed the animals uh, deuterated versus regular PUFA, that that does not disturb the ratio of the different outside yep. fatty acids in the brain. Um, <clears throat> but of course, those lipids are also bioactive in terms of how they affect uh, prostaglandin signaling and all this other stuff that right. are taken out of the membrane. Right. So have you got any evidence that it doesn't disturb those signaling? Yeah, we've, we've done it. There's not enough room to show it. We have several papers coming from very reliable labs to show that we're not disturbing anything. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. I think with that we'll need to move on. So thank you very much.